Hello everyone, my name is Dusty Smiley and I am the lead armor mechanic at the Flying Heritage and Combat Armor Museum. Today's presentation is a restoration overview of the museum's M55 self-propelled howitzer, better known as the Eve of Destruction. And I'd like to just take a couple of moments and give you a, a, just a quick background on, on my line of work before uh, becoming an em uh, employed at the museum. Uh, I used to work at my dad's business, Smiley's Incorporated up in Mount Vernon. And I would say that uh, probably in 2005, my dad and I started restoring military vehicles. And we started out as a hobby and then it became part of the business. And then that is how uh, we got involved with the M55 restoration project for the museum. Um, so on this slide here, what you're seeing is a, uh, it's an a 1942 International M24. And that vehicle and the M55, I think best represent uh, probably the, the pinnacle of my, of any of the restorations I've done. And I'm really proud of both of those. And I'm really proud of what I learned while working uh, for my dad. And I hope that I am carrying that on here at the museum. And I'm really uh, proud to share all of that with you guys. So enjoy. So here it is arriving at Smiley's Incorporated in Mount Vernon, Washington. Uh, it was a very exciting day. And as you can see, it took a big truck and a pretty long trailer to uh, haul the gun from the museum up to Mount Vernon. Uh, the gun itself weighs about 90,000 pounds. It's almost 12 feet wide and nearly 12 feet tall. The gun was built in 1952 by Packard. And so it was kind of cool. It's a locally built uh, here in Washington State. Once it was inside the shop, we were able to use the overhead crane to start uh, removing some of the heavier pieces. And here we have uh, one of the storage boxes and also uh, on the leading edge of that storage box is part of the ductwork where the exhaust uh, exits out the side and in the foreground of this picture you can see the four battery trays and they were severely corroded here we are uh, looking at the back of the gun uh, at the recoil spade which has been lowered to the ground with the overhead crane and the the spade is actually raised and lowered with an electric winch and cable housed inside the turret. There's no hydraulics on the spade at all. Uh, along so, some of the other repairs that we had to do, um, we had welding repairs. We had, uh, like here as an example, is a crack on the travel arm. Uh, so we opened up the crack and cleaned it up and uh, then welded it back up. And then we sanded it down and smoothed it all up. And then, of course, we uh, repainted everything. Here uh, you can see the storage compartment box uh, lids and those, those were made out of aluminum and some of the channels that were uh, riveted to the underside of the doors as uh, to reinforce the doors were damaged so we had to replace some of that. Uh, also on the turret the the driver door and the gunner door all the hinges had to be repaired and those doors were also removed. Uh, there were also little fenders that we had to straighten out. Uh, some of the hinges on the compartments were damaged and so we had to either replace or repair those and then there was some this just some miscellaneous sheet metal work that had to be straightened out as well. Uh, here the gun sits inside our shop. And right below the barrel, I want to point out that structure there. And that structure is what where all of the deck plates, the louvered deck plates, all fasten to that structure. And you can kind of see in the center of that structure, uh, that's your exhaust manifold and then the exhaust pipe uh, where it exits out the side there. And this structure also, we had to remove that structure in order to get the power plant out as well. Here is the uh, power plant as it sits inside the gun. Uh, it's a Continental uh, air-cooled V12. It has just under uh, 1,800 cubic inches. 
704 horsepower. Uh, it develops uh, 1,400 foot-pounds of torque. The yellow areas indicate the transmission oil coolers. Uh, in the blue area, it had twin air cleaners. Uh, one of them has been removed. And you can just see the top of one of the other ones there, that kind of the half moon structure there. The red uh, indicates where the, uh, that is the auxiliary uh, power unit, which was used to power up the turret. It would give the turret uh, electrical power so they wouldn't have to uh, run the main engine. Uh, it also, some other uh, facts about the gun, it's a 24 volt electrical system. Uh, the fuel capacity on board, it had twin 190-gallon fuel bladders. Its max speed was 30 miles per hour, and it got a whopping 0.43 miles to the gallon. Here we uh, you can see the Allison cross-drive transmission. And so the transmission, is a, it's a combined transmission. It, had, it's, it has the differential and the steering unit all in one. Uh, it has two forward and one reverse gears. Well, we, in order to prep the engine to try and see if we could get it to turn over, uh, we pulled all the spark plugs out. Uh, we quenched the cylinders and, with an oil bath. And we had to remove the U-joints. And there was a few other small details involved with prepping the engine to try and get it to turn over. Uh, here's the U-joints. They're sitting on the ground there, and they're quite large. Um, they probably weigh about 50 pounds a piece. We also fabricated a spline shaft that you could insert it into the front of the transmission uh, to see if we could get it to turn over. And unfortunately, it was all froze up. So that was kind of a kind of a disappointment. I need this picture here. You can see we've uh, got the power plant lifted out. And as you can see the turret, it had to be rotated enough to clear the barrel. And on the self-propelled howitzer, the, ro the, the turret would only rotate 30 degrees to the left or to the right, unlike a tank where you could you know, spin the turret all the way around. Here we're looking down inside the engine compartment after the power plant's been removed. And there was, literally inches of crud down in the bottom there as you can see. The next step uh, was to we put all that structure back on so that we could put the deck plates back on and then the open areas to the left and to the right of the deck plates we welded some uh, sheet metal in there uh, and it, for twofold. One the first reason was to we're trying to keep as much sandblasting grit out of that engine compartment as possible to uh, mitigate the cleanup afterwards. But then those deck plates also provided us with a nice platform to walk around on uh, during the sandblasting and uh, during the painting process. Uh, one of the very cool things about doing restoration work is discovering the history of the artifact. And I was able to find uh, some of the original markings. And here you can see the star on the turret and the registration number on the door. And on the back of the turret, I was able to find some very obscure and very hard to decipher uh, unit markings. And here we are doing uh, in the middle of the process of sandblasting. I'm up on top of the turret there. And then on the picture to the right, you can kind of see the the back of the turret has been blasted and then, but the bottom of the hole has not been blasted yet. So you can kind of just see the, the contrast there. Uh, we used a steel grit as a, a, a blasting media and it's reusable, which is unique. And it leaves behind a really nice clean profile that is uh, provide, provides an excellent service for the paint to adhere to as well. In this picture, um, we've got, I'll, do, I'll explain a little bit about the what we did with the road wheels and the hubs here. So the hub assemblies and the back sides of the road wheels and the wheel face where the lug nuts go, uh, we primed and painted those prior to remounting them, where, which is where they are in the picture here. And the reason for that is 
uh, you just could not access the backsides of the we road wheels, the backsides of the hubs. And because we had sandblasted all of those surfaces, we wanted to make sure that we got paint and uh, primer and paint on those to prevent any further corrosion. Um, so that's why these were, some of the pieces were pre-painted and then assembled. And then you can see we've also masked off the rubber on the, the road wheels and the return rollers. And here, here you can see uh, the primer was a red uh, epoxy. Uh, we custom tinted it to match as closely as we could the original uh, color of the primer that was on the gun. And now it's time for a top coat. We sprayed approximately 18 gallons of top coat. It was a custom uh, PPG acrylic urethane color. Uh, we mixed it to match uh, a federal spec uh, paint code that was um, specified by the museum. And to my excitement and great joy, it's Marine Corps green. So after the gun was done, uh, we pulled it out of the booth and then everything that we removed from the gun had to be sandblasted and painted as well. And here you can see I'm, I'm sandblasting the recoil spade here. Uh, here we're applying, I'm applying the epoxy primer to the uh, recoil spade and the storage boxes. And here I'm applying the top coat to the spade. Now you may be wondering why that's such a kind of a goofy looking uh, paint pattern there. And the reason for that is you always want to paint your hard to reach surfaces or your angled surfaces first. Uh, and the reason for that is when you when you go and do start spraying all of your flat surfaces and easy to reach surfaces, it prevents you from getting runs in your paint. And on to final assembly. Uh, we're this couple pictures here we're uh, putting the storage boxes on and they were a really tight fit and so we had to be super careful to not scratch any of the surrounding paint and uh, it was it was a bit of a challenge to get those in without scratching anything and here we are applying the marine corps stencils and painting them in marine corps yellow These are the stencils that went onto the back of the hole, which also include the uh, unit markings. So the replacement track, uh, we had to break it down into manageable sections just because of the weight uh, so that I could move them around in the, in the booth while I was sandblasting and then also so they were easier to handle uh, when it came time to paint them as well. And here you can see the track sections sitting on sawhorses uh, where they were painted. And uh, we then had to reassemble the track. And here we are getting ready to uh, pull the M55 in to uh, put the track on. And here it sits uh, on display at the Flying Heritage and Combat Armor Museum. And I have to point out that uh, Kelly Zimney, one of our aircraft mechanics, hand painted the uh, eve of destruction up on the barrel. Thank you, Kelly, for doing such a nice job. And I want to thank all of you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the content. And I want to give uh, all my fellow Marines out there a big Semper Fi. Thanks again. We'll see you on the next one.